Mm -hmm. All right. So mm -hmm. I like these conversations to be to feel informal, mm -hmm. but for some reason with the camera on, I always feel like I need to be more formal than I want to be. So I'll try to be. Uh, I'll try to find a balance between keeping it informal and fun, and I don't know, trying to also provide the people that are watching online, you know, with something to kind of take away with them. Mm -hmm. Um, the people online will be missing out, unfortunately, on the little fun piece that we're going to start off with. You know, this is a this is a talk about play, so we'll actually be doing some play ourselves tonight. Start off the game with catch first. <laughs> so one of the things that kind of always brings me back to my childhood is when you first crack open a brand new uh, thing of Play-Doh. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of uh, just the smell of it and the texture of it and just just a fresh uh, can of play-doh always kind of reminds me of childhood so mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> and that brings me back to childhood too it's the trouble of opening it <laughs> so before you know before we get into anything I thought I'd just pass around some play-doh and give you guys the opportunity to just over the course of the night, you know, while we're talking, um, you know, while I'm speaking, while we're while we're talking, um, to play with the dough, uh, you can make something with it if you if you want to. You can mold something with it, or you can just kind of you know play with it, whatever you want to do. And then um, towards the end of our discussion, we'll come back to the play dough. So for now, just enjoy it while Maybe we talk. Those crisps. Exactly right. That's <laughs> one thing you can do with it. Oh, hi. Hi. You need some play dough. <laughs> Welcome to playtime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, this is a, like the like the last topic that I spoke about, which was emotional intelligence. This is a big topic, play. I mean, we could talk for days on end about play, all the all the different facets facets of it, all the all the nuances of play, um, all of the ways in which play uh, you know affects our lives. Um, so in an hour and a half, I'm really hoping, you know, my main goal is just to kind of spark a bit of a discussion, you know, about play, about the meaning of play in our lives, the meaning of play in our kids' lives. Um, and so in addition to maybe providing some of my own views and a little bit of background information, um, I really also just want to facilitate a uh, conversation. So if you guys can uh, contribute, um, that would be really, really helpful. I'd rather just have kind of a, you know, a discussion than, than a lecture. So. Um, the first thing that I wanted to do, well, maybe the second thing, after passing out the Play-Doh, um, was to show this little clip, and I can't for some reason enlarge it, but I think you guys from where you're sitting can see it well enough. We'll just start off with this. I won't say much about it, we'll just play this. Yeah, maybe I'll wait a second. I'll just wait a second for it to come in. So this is actually, this is a clip, um, from a play therapy website, which provides a lot of information about the way play is used therapeutically uh, for kids who would need that. Um, so this is just the clip they have on the site. Oh, and I think it's relevant in general, not just for play therapy, but for general purposes, so. I'm sorry, I didn't introduce yourself. Oh, oh yeah, I, I could have introduced myself. I skipped, I skipped that whole part. We can do that. <laughs> Okay. I thank you for kind of take some sure, sure. doing our workshop. That's great. I just launched right in. I didn't even give you a chance to. Uh, <laughs> no, that's all right. That's, all right. that's okay. You're being recorded here. Oh, no, no. Your lateness is recorded. No, I'm just kidding. I've said some other things on recording <laughs> that have been much worse than that. So thank you for you coming, go. Jason. For how are your hands? You got good hands. There you go. Thank you. All right. I have to say one thing, and so since we were waiting for Laura, um, <laughs> that um, we've done this workshop almost every year, mm -hmm. uh, but I always call uh, the workshop the importance of play. Mm -hmm. And when you said, let's say, you know, the power of play, I thought, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. you know, it's you even better. Uh -huh. There's so much power in play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so. Along the same lines, though, the same thinking, the importance, the power, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, should oh hi that's okay this is good I'm glad people are uh, making their way here there you go there you go feel free to play with it while we talk tonight um, also feel free to actually sculpt something if you want to and then at the end you know we'll use that as part of our discussion also so 
Um, would you like me to introduce myself a little bit, or? Yes, why well, don't yeah. you, in case somebody is watching that, uh, Mr. you know, they, they know you more. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, all right, so I'll introduce myself, uh, Jason. I'm Jason Rodker. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, also a certified school psychologist. Um, for a handful of years, I worked in various school settings, public school settings, but also alternative school settings. Um, at all levels, elementary, middle school, high school levels also. Um, I've also worked in community mental health centers, doing kind of providing outpatient therapy services for kids and families. And right now I'm working in a group private practice, working mostly with kids and teenagers, but also some adults. Um, and obviously when, you know, when I'm working with kids, the family is always involved. So there's always parent work, you know, uh, meeting with parents and doing family work also. Um, so that's a little bit, is that, is that enough yeah, of an intro? Thank you. Yeah, well, okay. like how are you doing? Sure, sure. <laughs> Play is a, is a topic that's of particular um, relevance to me. Um, and that I really enjoy talking about a lot because I think play is so important to the development of our, you know, to our kids' development. Um, and being a psychologist that works primarily with kids, play is the modality that I most often utilize. It's kind of my primary way of working with kids. Um, so I personally have experienced the power that play can have um, for helping kids to cope with experiences, um, but also just assisting, just aiding with ch children's natural development. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd start by just showing this clip. This is, again, this is from a play therapy website. I'll let the clip speak for itself and then we'll talk about it afterwards. So the point of that was not just to like advertise play therapy and advertise this particular site, but I thought it was just like pretty much summed up exactly why I think play can be so important for kids as a mode of communication, because that's not what a child is gonna say when they come home from school. When you ask a kid how, how their day was at school, they're not gonna go into that eloquent kind of, uh, you know, speech about what happened at school. Um, but they are likely to communicate their feelings, their thoughts, their experiences um, in less direct ways. So through artistic expression or through play activities, creating stories. And so, especially working with kids who have, ex who have experienced um, emotional upsets of all kinds, play can be a really uh, valuable um, vehicle for communication. But as adults, it's not always easy for us to know what it is a child is communicating through their play. Children often communicate um, through the use of metaphor. You know, during play, children use metaphors. They'll um, create characters, or they'll create stories, or they'll, you know, create a picture, or they'll use different different objects that might have significance for them. Um, so the communication of kids through play is really communication through metaphors. So in a way, it's almost like kids are speaking a different language, you know, than we're speaking when they are trying to communicate these things. Um, especially during the early years, you know, especially up until the age of, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, even, you know, before kids really have a firm grasp of, of the language and enough self-reflection to be able to talk directly about their experiences. Um, so play is, is, a, is a way for them to do that. Um, before we 
really get into the meat of things, I thought maybe we would just share some of our own play experiences. I wanted, I'd like to hear from you guys about um, what you do as adults for play. What kind of play do you engage in as adults? Have a day in the life of a catch. Hope till here we do play that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking to actually to um, somebody uh, in the office. I don't know, Liza or Chelsea or something. And it was interesting what um, Nance Bowers uh, mentioned in the testimonial. She just left from the school. Her son, who was here today, came until second grade, and so then she left the testimonial. And she mentions one thing there that I think is super important, at least to me, and that it's very subtle, so it's very hard to see. Um, I take what people take, you know, as work um, in a playful way, they, let's say. I mean, I'm responsible for what we're doing, but mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make a difference for me to say, okay, they finish working and then comes, you know, my playtime, my weekend let's say, because I really enjoy the work. So, mm. and I remember uh, one of my professors talking about that when I was about 20, and how important is the ludic mood in what we do. And I, at that moment I understood intellectually, but I really didn't understand because I was so young. And now I can see the difference. So I, you know, I do, I paint, I do other things, I love to dance. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's just, uh, uh, Having that ludic uh, mode into things makes a difference. Can you say what you mean, mm -hmm. ludic mode? Well, ludic comes from play, right? Mm -hmm. The word is in Latin. And so, uh, let's say, um, instead of feeling like a work, which we know most of us do as a task or something that we have to do, that, you know, there's, it's like um, you you let it flow or you know through the day and then you are resilient let's say into finding you know the things that need to be done and pretty much moving as the children move through play right mm -hmm. so it may change you know they set up a whole house to be a cat and a dog and, a, mm -hmm. and then you know that play scenario changes maybe mm -hmm. in 10 minutes and i think if you let yourself flow into that the day is you know at least for me it works better Right. You know, I have a better day. Yeah. Right. So allowing <laughs> so, allowing yourself to be spontaneous. Spontaneous, and flexible. resilient to that. Yeah. You know, and, and actually, when you work with kids, you have to pretty much do that, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they will agree because if you don't go with the flow, you're going to be facing, you know, resistance there, yeah, and then uh, frustration, you know, and many things that come with. Right. Yeah. yeah, we do tend, I think, generally in society, to have this view that. Um, especially as a, for adults, our work should be work. It shouldn't be yeah. fun, it's not play. And work and play are very separate, I think, for yeah. us, at least in this country. I don't, I don't know how it is in other cultures. Yeah, but I think very much, I mean, yeah. it's not, right? Right, so some of us are lucky enough to find play within our work. Yeah. You know, that, that's where, you know, where we find our play. We, mm -hmm. you know, some people merge the two. I, I personally, you know, as a play therapist, have merged the two, yeah. you know, so that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, but. For those of us who aren't lucky enough to have jobs like that, what other ways do you guys have to bring play into your lives? I feel like I'm confusing play with what you do with the walk. Is mm -hmm. that you think it's the same? Well, it might not be so funny? different. So, yeah. say, what do you do to relax? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then it might not be play. Well, well, I really don't know what she means. Going to a bar or something. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or meeting friends. Like to me, that's a form of play. Is meeting my girlfriend or mm -hmm. something like that, and just having a night. Is that sure. a middle form of play? Potentially. Yeah. 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 I mean, we can really have. We can expand our definition of play. We can have a wide definition of play. I guess I'm asking about things you do. You know, more so than just play. Things you do uh, to unwind, things you do to have fun. Enjoyment. Fun. Okay. Yeah, let's, or, yeah. yeah, for fun. For yeah, fun. we can. Playing football with Leo doesn't count then, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it has that enjoyable. It's enjoyable, yeah. I have fun with him. There you go. I'm having fun with him. But okay. That's not something I'm doing for myself as much as I enjoy doing it with him because he likes it. Okay, okay. But I do like it. But I wouldn't do it if he didn't want to do it. Right, okay. 
So for you, <laughs> no, no, please do, please. So, so for you going to hang out with friends, you know, going to, unwinding at a bar or something like that with friends. That's, you know, just drinks, dinner, yeah. something like that, something social. Yep, yep. Entertaining. Well, yeah. Tony, like, please validate. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Yeah. How about other people? Cooking. Cooking, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's true. I didn't think of that. I love to cook as well. Yeah, and that's yeah, it's a lot of yeah. Yeah, me too. Cooking is a big one for me too. I especially I find I don't love following recipes so much. Right. Yeah. For me, the playful aspect mm -hmm. is just kind of like to taking create. what I have and creating something. Yeah. So that can be very much play. Cooking is very much play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I actually find that. Uh, you know, very much so now with kids, I really detest following <laughs> recipes because it's so hard to, because yeah. they require so much focus and it's right. so hard to focus and inevitably mm -hmm. I leave something out. Yeah. So it's it's that kind of just, if I had to follow a recipe, it, it's that kind of just like throwing yeah. things together and seeing what works and even involving the kids in the creativity and figuring out, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, what what they think it should be. Mm -hmm. Right. It's kind of like, it reminds me of what uh, Laura was saying about uh, kind of spontaneity. Yeah. You know, there's a, spon there's a yeah. spontaneous aspect to that, to going in without a recipe, mm -hmm. just kind of seeing what happens. That yeah. allows you to create that important too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, kids often, they approach play without a plan. It just kind of evolves, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you could go, always go in with a, with a strict plan, um, mm -hmm. you take a bit of the creative aspect out of it. Oh, you, you do. Know, so, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, you develop the skills playing too, and so the more spoken and more sophisticated plays they can set up too. Right. I know what Albina can say. <laughs> like playing with my dog was too loud. Oh, with a dog. Uh -huh. right. oh, yeah, we forgot. Oh, yeah. What kinds of things do you do with the dog? I'm um, working with him. I'm trying like, to train him to cross the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be patient with people who is passing mm -hmm. another dog. Sometimes I just play with him and like he's from the backyard. Sometimes I let him play on the field. <laughs> <laughs> and and just, dancing. And, and right, just yeah. run. Yeah. And just run, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dogs are very playful. Mm -hmm. They love to play. Yeah. Yeah, and I like dancing. <laughs> um, I, we can announce, and I, I can give you the news too, that we are going to start on Tuesdays at 2, we're going to start folk dancing upstairs, so people are watching if they want to yeah. watch it. <laughs> folk dancing open to the public, so 2 p.m. on Tuesdays. Yeah, okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. You can play if you like. Come play. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy doing um, active things. I, I enjoy being active, like horseback riding, tennis, and maybe going for walks, but then I also love just reading and getting lost in a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think those are my two favorite things, kind of mm -hmm. directions, I guess, to go for play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't get to do it too, too often, but um, I really like to go to places that I haven't visited before, even if it's kind of like a local town, and just walk around. And I do it a lot with my husband. Um, and we like, recently we've been doing it more in New York City where we'll just plant ourselves somewhere as kind of a home base and then walk around different blocks. And yeah, it's like we don't, I would say we talk, but it's more just like people watching mm -hmm. and getting a feel for our environment. Um, it's, it's definitely a way to unwind. Um, and I also enjoy playing with my dog, Albina. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is very playful, um, and probably for the first 20 minutes that I'm home, I just sit with him either in the kitchen or on the floor of my bedroom and like toss toys and have him run to me and run away. Um, and then my husband and I will also play the who does he like best game. <laughs> so we'll stand on the other opposite sides of the room and we'll each call him and we'll see who he runs to first. <laughs> So you make a game out of it. Yeah. That's fun, yeah. <laughs> I also really like to uh, visit cities, especially cities I haven't been to before. Um, again, without a plan, and just kind of walk around and That's see fun. what I discover. You know, there's definitely you know a playful aspect to that also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love board games. I have to say, yeah. I mentioned mm -hmm. that I love board games. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to find people that 
in board games. Lexi. Lexi will play board games. Board games oh, she can come. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I want to play. I do. Lexi but I don't do you like board games? You know what? Yeah. I didn't think I did, but I like to play with Leo. Hmm. It's yeah. different, yeah. I feel like, playing yeah. with him. He wins a lot. Legitimately, yeah. <laughs> for <laughs> card games, like he yeah. plays, you know, different card They're games. They're so much more focused. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what it is. Out all the distractions. Mm-hmm. A running list of things in their head. Seriously. <laughs> 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 I remember as a kid, my mom every once in a while would have, they had a regular thing, like her and her, her girlfriends would come over and they would play uh, Trivial Pursuit. Oh so yeah, would, yeah. that's know. cool though. <laughs> but uh, I don't know how much adults play board games anymore. Like I, I yeah, have right. a group of friends yeah. that once in a while we get together and, and actually mm-hmm. decide to play board games, you know, but I don't know if it's that common, you know. Hmm. But yeah. uh, Well, we've just played, I mean, I just played with some friends like uh, Mm. But it's just like, you know, you have to propose it because it's not something that comes up now, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So you said not having a plan, that's a form of planning, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That, I feel, is more rare now mm-hmm. than being older. Right. So it's that much more special, I feel, when it happens. When right. You have a free day or a free moment yeah. when you're able just to play by your and do, you know, do what you want. Right. Mm-hmm. Because time is so much more scheduled when it's you're. It's so scheduled. Yeah. But, yeah. But I think it's still what I meant, you know, in that uh, finding that a uh, ludic mode. It's I mean, it's hard to explain. Maybe I'm. Uh, it's not that you just have because I come here and I have sometimes one thing after the other one. Um, but just letting yourself go with that flow, because mm-hmm. otherwise, you know, I think it's not the same. It doesn't. At least for me, it doesn't feel the same. No, you're right. Mm-hmm. You know, I have days at work where I feel like I'm just trudging through, but then other days where I'm having a great time, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. if it's something difficult or whatever, for whatever reason, it's a different mode. Yeah. So that must be what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, right? yeah, and that fighting out, I, I feel genuinely lucky to be able to play for the majority yeah. of my day here. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, We're lucky. And yeah. like when, the, when we set up memory <laughs> games and things for the kids, I like to participate too, yeah. mm-hmm. and um, and it's it's really it's fun, and time goes by really quickly actually. So in the days that you know you're engaged with the kids, um, of course, like in indoor and outdoor playtime, you know it's more like looking on and spectating, but in class when we're playing you know math games or uh, memory games for language arts. Those are the games that we can, or that I participate in and genuinely enjoy, and that's when I find the time goes by like, like a mm-hmm. snap. It's so fast. Mm-hmm. Not in your experience. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a good vibe here. You know, even when I come in for Russian class and you walk in, you hear them like, you know, like, hey, are you volunteers? They're like little voices. Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just a different it feels mindset. Good. Yeah. yeah. The other day, actually, uh, yesterday, we were having a meeting with Ashley, Kirby, Jessica, and then Anne-Marie shows up. I realized, oh, oh, must be 11. <laughs> we have a class, mm-hmm. so we do uh, French and Spanish, English and Spanish. We ended up doing French and Spanish while they kept talking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this important for the entire hour that we were doing the class on so my desk. Uh-huh. <laughs> they were, so they, it must feel good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then after that, we had the folk dancing, and Marie joined the folk dancing, too, so, yeah, it was fun. Mm-hmm. How about, um, we talked about our own play experiences. I, I mentioned, uh, like, you know, cooking. Also, I like to play basketball and do active things, like you were saying, too, you know, be, being physically active, hiking, and things like that um, for myself. What about when you were kids? What kinds of things did you do when you were, you know, five, six, seven, ho- however old, you know, you can remember back? Um, what kinds of things did you do as a kid? If left to your own devices, you know? Oh, playing. I mean, I have a list of things. Yeah. I played play in the game. park at the beach, you know. Mm-hmm. Just playing play mostly when my memories are playing when, uh, with nature in yeah. nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, with friends or cousins, you know, all these little games. Actually, I was the teacher always. All my cousins were the students. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew that, right? Everybody around in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. 
But besides oh that God. part, <laughs> yeah, besides that, you're going to the park. I mean, all day in, ba in the bike, climbing the trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in summertime, in the beach, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. playing, you know, whatever was on the beach. Right, yeah. right. I love I playing in the know. woods and, like, making, d discovering, like, paths and forts. in mm -hmm. like, the woods seemed so expansive behind my parents' house on their one-acre lot. Right. <laughs> you know, and there was, you know, other lots, like, right there. But it seemed like the woods were so deep. <laughs> it was just, like... It's not true. that many trees. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, but I, I think it, it just like really kind of, you know, pulled you and pulled me and my friends in, and we just kind of had this whole imagination, imaginary uh, thing going on. Yeah. yeah, I have a really distinct memory. I, I mean, I played I think primarily like imaginary games and mm -hmm. pretend games growing mm -hmm. up, but um, my best friend actually lived in this neighborhood right across the street here. And um, it was the same thing. She, her, she probably had about one acre and a few trees and woods, but there was one space in her backyard where you couldn't see the house from the house. You couldn't see that mm -hmm. area, and we spent probably three weeks in the summer building this expansive fort back there, and just taking things out of her parents' house and creating <laughs> this fort. Um, blank with blankets and um, like we took all the toilet paper and we built this like door with toilet paper <laughs> and her parents couldn't figure out where all the things were going <laughs> but it's such a like clear memory we would play in that fort just building it that was our game was building see how big we could get it before we had to take it down before someone noticed <laughs> that all the objects from the house were disappearing so At the beach, like um, um, I we used to be spend the summer in a beach that has many um, medusas, you know, just jellyfish. Mm -hmm. but I was just thinking that. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we couldn't really go in the water because you know we're just getting all them all over. Mm -hmm. And so we would wait for them to come, <laughs> turn them over. We knew how to catch them. You know, they had to use like um, nets. And so then we would turn them this way cut them like that and then make piles and we thought if we made piles of them then we could get in the water one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> so we should spend the day making piles of jellyfish. I mean what yeah. else you that's what I used to do. I used to but not not really to that degree, but I used to <laughs> you have kind of hold the beach for jellyfish parts, like just pieces of oh. jellyfish and we fill buckets with them. No, this <laughs> this beach had many. You know, for more, for days depended on the current. Mm -hmm. I also remember being outside a lot collecting things. If it was in the woods, yeah. collecting who knows what leaves. If it was at the beach, collecting you know, stones and shells and things like that. Yeah. A lot of outside time. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time also you know, just riding bikes you know, with kids yeah. in the neighborhood just all day long, just be on the bikes, yeah. you know, back and forth to town, around the block, yeah. racing, and doing whatever. Yeah. Um, but a lot of out, uh, outside time, yeah. I remember. Yeah. What about um, other people? Other kids? I have two brothers. Right, right. Playing in the snow and stuff outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I grew up in a pretty simple life of kind of outside. Um, I would be in the park where school sometimes or just play from my school range, but sometimes I play with my neighbors who like better than I know. I know they don't like me, and then with the exception of the building where, where I live, so I know their name. And that's it. Mm. But we play a lot of. Were you in Moscow? Hmm? Were you in Moscow? No, in, in, in Ireland. It's a little bit south of Moscow. So we play like monkey in the middle, mm -hmm. hide and seek, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and walk okay. around pretty huge building. Mm -hmm. And I would have taken time to find them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Puddles outside in the winter and make the pull-ups. Mm -hmm. yeah. In summer we play with ropes. Yeah. And, and when you like uh, jump in the with elastic, do you use elastic? Yeah, the yeah, jump? yeah, yeah. Elastic, yeah. 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 Do you know that game or not? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun game. It's a we fun actually game. could do it. You put, you put it around your ankle. You put it around, around and then it has the step. <laughs> oh, I love it. I had one with a lemon on me. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the it's lemon twist. Like Yes. <laughs> Look at that, I didn't know that. We should play one. And then this one's the sky. When you put it in the air and you have to jump that high. 
Oh my gosh. You know a play? Yeah, yeah. 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 I have to teach you. <laughs> it's a new <laughs> different generation. <laughs> huh. Yeah. It's very simple. We have a lot here because I used to do it at the school where they go really cool. Huh. Mm. I'll show you. It's fun. Anyone else want to share childhood experiences playing? I remember field day too. Mm. Like back in school. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shoots and stuff. Sack races. Tug of war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, one of my favorites was the uh, the egg toss. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. What do you do with it? Toss the egg. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> there's there's two, egg yeah, I just yeah. remember yeah. you'd stand across from someone, yeah. and you would just toss the egg. There'd be a, you'd, there'd be two lines facing each other, and you would toss the egg back and forth, and whoever's egg was left at the end, whoever's egg didn't break, was the winner. Wow. Look at yeah. that. Oh, wow. I remember a. Walking with a spoon mm -hmm. on the egg. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do that? Oh, yeah. That or we did what, the other one? Two or three? Mm -hmm. We did um, three legged races mm -hmm. where they right. would, you would pick a partner and mm -hmm. they'd tie your leg, center legs together, and then you'd have to see how far you could run without falling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What to do at cottage school field day? Yeah. 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 And the glue yeah. on the tip, the uh, pin the tail of the donkey, yeah. yeah. So a common theme seems to be a lot of outdoor time, nature, yeah. Yeah. a lot in nature, mm -hmm. right? Um, also a lot of creativity, just kind of making up games, you know, making mm -hmm. up things to do. Um, so a lot of creativity and, out and outdoor time, I think, was kind of a common factor in what everybody said. How would you, for you know, those of you who have kids, you can think of your own kids, or if you don't have your own, you know, kids of your own, you know, you know, children. Um, how would you contrast those experiences with the kinds of things kids do today for play? Are kids engaging in the same kinds of things, or is play different today than it was when we were growing up? Our kids, or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's funny. Yeah. I mean, I, I oh, comment on either, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I think in general, uh, the instinct for kids is to kind of engage in, mm -hmm. especially from a young age, you know, in, engaging and in, in playing a very creative way, but I think, you know, a lot of, Kind of the norm in, in our society at some point becomes um, just uh, the kids time being spent with media mm -hmm. um, driven by TVs or, or commercialism in general even if they're not watching a show they're you know wanting the toys from the show and playing with those which kind of like I feel like limit creativity a little bit mm -hmm. um, so I, I know at least for us um, I, I think my kids have a kind of a similar experience to what I had in terms of Play, the types of play being outside I think actually I, I love watching my kids because I I have two so they they play together and they really build off of each other um, I was pretty I have siblings who are a lot older so I was kind of the only one in the house when I was little and so the play for me alone was different than than the two kids mm -hmm. um, you know, I enjoyed my time and kind of getting lost in my own thoughts, but I also enjoy watching my two kids kind of engage and play together and what they come up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar experience, um, except the other way around. Right. So I'm <laughs> much older than my siblings, and I was the only child for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so my experience in my house playing by myself is was much different than how my siblings played. And... Um, for like when I was playing by myself, it was very much um, like I played like I still a lot of imaginary games. Um, like I had my parents had a cooking set for me, so I would you know cook a lot, mm -hmm. um, and I would you know build things with blocks. But it was very quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then watching my siblings play it was they were twins, and it was very loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Even though, um, you know, like now, if you saw my siblings, my sister is very quiet. But she when, was quiet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but they when, came here. Actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when they would play together at home, and it was much more, you know, my brother directing the play, but it was um, much louder than I remember my childhood at home being. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it was incredible to see how they played in the games that they created because it was much more, you know, combined. Mm -hmm. um, and my sister is very creative, so she would, you know, create these intricate obstacle courses 
and it would be my brother's job to run as fast as he could through them. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah. 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 So their strengths get you to get an interest mm -hmm. in They supplement it. Yeah. yeah. They're twins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think my kids were lucky that they spent a lot of time in a farm. So mm -hmm. even though I was raised in the city, it's a different experience, but I, you know, I went to the park and rode the bike all day long and you know, it was outside. We would come home when it was time to eat, actually. Or you know, we would try to do the homework as fast as we could so we could go play. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were lucky being in the farm. Um, especially, I mean, for Juana, I mean, she has great memories, but we were talking last night, actually, uh, they were lucky that Francisco had the opportunity to be in the farm, my son, and I hope he's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he needed to climb. He was a climber. I mean, mm. he's, he's just, you know, from crawling to climbing. I don't, mm -hmm. You know, the walking part is like it almost didn't exist. <laughs> he was just climbing. So I don't know what it would have been, you know, of him if he didn't have that opportunity to be all day, you know, we're playing with the goose or climbing here and there right. and running in the creek and, you know, playing with the animals actually, right. picking toes and things. So I think he would be a different person. Without that outlet. Without that. Where would that energy yeah. have gone? If you and then, you know, outlet, right? they they were not exposed to video games and all that. <coughs> so right. we were lucky that, you know, they had all that too. So then indoors they would, both of them would create, you know, any you know, scenarios to play. Or, so they had a similar childhood in that sense, although they were raised in the farm and I was in the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then when we moved to a neighborhood, I remember them thinking, okay, now we can play with the kids in the neighborhood, because in the farm, they were, you know, the cows, the cows, the goats, you know, there were no neighbors to play with. Mm -hmm. So I thought this is going to be a different experience, right? I actually was thinking about that they were going to have a similar experience to mine being raised in a city that you could go knock at the door you know, and you would have a friend I met you know, mm -hmm. to play with, go ready by. And so actually, this is what, uh, maybe eight years ago or 10 years ago, that we moved to a neighborhood and I thought, okay, kids, you know, can play. And nobody was outside. So that was a surprise for me and for the kids too because my son then kept climbing the trees. Actually in the park when we went to see the house, he tried all of them. And then he kept climbing and for maybe, I don't know, a few months, <laughs> And did he realize he was the only one? <laughs> he had all the trees to himself. I mean, and then he started meeting kids, you know, that went to his same grade. Um, and I guess, I mean, we have to ask him, but I guess it was embarrassing for him to be mm -hmm. outside playing and being climbing the trees. Mm -hmm. So then he stopped climbing the trees. Once in a while, he would have a friend that could climb the trees as well. <laughs> he was like an expert on trees. So then they would go together. But, you know, by himself, like he used to do it on the farm, then he realized, okay, the kids, you know, we didn't know what they were doing. I guess they were, you know, I mean, I knew they were doing video games, I guess, right. inside right. or whatever, and mm -hmm. watching TV, I don't know. Right, so I see how even li living in an area that is uh, you know, very privileged to be here, mm -hmm. uh, many kids spend time inside. Right. Yeah, inside and doing, who knows, you know, quiet activities or, yeah. So that's sad to see. Yeah, yeah it I seems. I've had that experience though, where I live too. Yeah. There's, there's no, it's so quiet. Mm -hmm. I don't Nobody else. Us too. And Even I see parents like, walk around the block. Nobody's where outside. Is everybody. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, also, it's like the the school day. Uh, some of the kids in our neighborhood are a little bit older than than our kids, and they're at that point where it's like by the time they get are finished school and then get home on the bus, but they also have after school activities. So I see the parents like zooming back and oh. forth, going to like one million activities. Oh, and, yeah, and I think that's sense. a lot of what it is. So on weekdays, mm -hmm. yes, I know that's at least true. Some, some of our and neighbors And safety, here. too, right? Safety reasons and sometimes... Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's true, because we would just go, mm -hmm. like you yeah. said, in the woods, yeah. bike, whatever. I can't even imagine the weight of just yeah, doing going. that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't even yeah. imagine. There's one exception, and it's this one child in my on my street. And I've... I mean, I've been living at home for the past three years, and every evening he takes this long walk, and he walks from, he lives next door to me, so he walks all the way to the one end of the road and back, and he has his headphones on, and he dances. Oh, oh, so so cool. And he's in the middle of the street, and he just oh dances. My God. And how, how old, how old is he? Um, well, it started about three years ago, and he was quite small. He's suddenly gotten very tall, so I'm assuming uh, he must be like 13, 14. Oh, good that he keeps yeah. doing it. Yeah. And 
I, dancing has changed. In the beginning, he was like very wild dancing, <laughs> but he couldn't. We were concerned too because he would have the headphones on. We were afraid the cars wouldn't like, yeah, see yeah, him yeah. and they would keep going. But he's now sort of more to the side, and now his dancing is getting much more um, quieter. So I'm hoping he doesn't stop because it's <laughs> really amazing. But um, whenever I see that, I'm like, finally, like somebody. Right. is outside <laughs> right. and really doing something that they love and he's a great mm. dancer it's like alone too and alone yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's uh, actually it's a pretty good segue you know you brought up the idea of um, how structured a kids time is you know and all these structured activities that they're involved in so I want to take a little bit of time to talk about kind of the differences between structured play versus unstructured play. They both have pros and cons. Um, so we'll start with structured play. Um, in my mind, you know, structured play has, has a place. I mean, you know, rule-bound games, you know, such as board games, organized sports, things like that. Um, you know, they do provide kids with, with structure. You know, I guess to some extent, um, it's important that kids do learn to to deal with structure, they're going to have to deal with structure throughout their lives, you know, in different settings. So, so it provides some structure, um, teaches compliance with rules, which is a, it's a, it's a skill, you know. Um, respect for authority, you know, if you're uh, responding to a coach or a teacher who's conducting an organized kind of activity or an organized sport, um, there is an element of, you know, respecting the authority figure that's involved in these activities. Um, there's some discipline that kids learn through structured activities also. Again, being part of a team, playing a sport, things like that. Um, and also, um, those more organized um, activities sometimes can provide kids with this inclination with a, with a competitive outlet. You know, some kids do have that kind of uh, competitive juice. You know, they like competing against someone, testing, testing their mettle against, you know, against other kids. Um, so, it, uh, sports especially can provide that competitive outlet for kids. Some of the limitations that I, that I see with structured uh, play is that too much too early on really stifles a ch child's ability to uh, really get into their creative, you know, into their, into their creativity. Um, too much structure, you know, too early on in a child's life, I think actually can in some ways squash their creative drive all to, you know, all together. You know, if it's, if they're involved purely in structured activities all the time, you know, they may end up passing through that kind of critical period where their desire for creativity kind of doesn't materialize, it doesn't, uh, doesn't develop, it doesn't evolve. Um, and in a case like that, I think, you know, the, kid, the child is really missing out. Um, another limitation of structured play is that the controls and the rules are all set by an outside authority, usually by an adult or whoever created the game. And so kids don't have the opportunity to create their own rules. And to govern themselves. Unless they come to a coach, and take out of school, and then they create their own games. Hey, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so they create their own <laughs> rules to the games, right? Right. Well, actually, the whole game. The whole yeah, game, even right? Even a board game. Right. Right. Create, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, I see so many kids, and you guys see it too. You know, so many kids are involved in multiple sports these days. Two or three sports kids play now. I remember when I was a kid, there were plenty of kids who didn't play any sports. You know, we just, they just weren't the athlete kids. They just weren't the sporty kids. You know, they found other things to do. But today, it seems like almost every kid is involved at, in at least one sport, if not multiple sports. Um, and why do you think uh, people feel that they have to do the sports? I think it gets back, I don't know, I think one of the reasons is that it gets back to the fact that kids aren't outside getting that physical activity as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. So parents still knowing that that's important for kids, parents think the only way to get their kids that physical activity is to enroll them in sports. Because um, actually we're discussing uh, Nikos, a physical education teacher, so we were um, talking about that last night, and I said, to me, sports is not a synonymous of health anymore. You know, it never was. I mean, I was very active too, but I um, only did a few, like, uh, structured sports, right? And so, and he said, I agree with that. I mean, he's surrounded, you know, the injuries and injuries and then the competition and the stress they go through. Right. The many things that they learn stuff, like you say, with structure games, but also there's a lot there that is not really very healthy. Right, right. 
Well, I think the thing too is like you're talking about, you know, kids <clears throat> playing two or three sports and like I can remember a time when I was little where sometimes I did play two or three sports, but like I would have softball practice once a week or, you know, right. like yeah. the sport right, things right, now, right. it's like every coach thinks, um, it's the only it, thing well, every, doing. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every coach thinks it's the only thing they're doing. They're mm -hmm. not aware of other conflicts. Mm -hmm. And then, so I don't know, the kids end up being occupied with sports like five plus days a week. Right. Um, whereas yeah. I think at least when I was younger, everything was a lot more casual. Mm. Right. It's yeah, true. I would say. So and they start so true. young too. Yeah. yeah. I, feel like yep. I didn't start doing something yeah. until I was ten, mm -hmm. maybe fifth grade or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now they're all three and four and starting. Something. And they say actually they burn right. out earlier now mm -hmm. because they start also too young. Yep. So then they, you know, some kids don't want to do it anymore. Or they get hurt. Yeah, that's a good point. It's not so much the number of activities, it's just the time. Yeah. The time committed yeah. to all these activities. Like you said, every sport mm -hmm. is a full-time sport, mm -hmm. you know, basically. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. You know, also, you know, in, uh, in structured activities like that, the interpersonal exchanges are all kind of scripted and dictated. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a member of a team, you know what your role is, you know what everybody else's role is. If somebody steps out of their role, there's a coach there or an adult there to kind of you know, fix that and put people back in their roles. If there's a conflict between people on, you know, teammates or one kid on one team and another kid on another team, there's always an adult there, a referee or a coach or a parent, often parents will step in to mediate the conflict right away. So kids don't necessarily in those kind of settings have the opportunity to problem solve of course, yeah. and to work things out amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they're missing out on an opportunity for social skills. Yeah. And so it's no wonder that these kids that are over scheduled with all these uh, adult dictated activities and adult mediated activities are not developing social skills, you know. So, so then let's talk about unstructured play now. So what, what is it that unstructured play uh, provides that structured play does not? Um, these things will be, you know, pretty obvious to you guys, I think. Um, unstructured play provides the opportunity for imagination creativity we've been talking about that already um, also the opportunity to kind of learn about one's strengths and weaknesses you know by just kind of trying things um, you figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at um, free more free expression of emotions and experiences you know on a football field there's not that much opportunity to say uh, what this experience is like for you to be tackled by someone or to tackle someone else or you know whatever um, to try and fail you know there's not really the opportunity to process those kind of experiences um, in an unstructured setting um, kids could spontaneously there's more room for kids to spontaneously kind of comment on what's going on as it's going on and to bounce ideas off of other kids mm -hmm. and to hear other kids respond to what that child you know has to say about what's happening um, the development of self-control you know I work with in, in my practice I see a lot of kids that haven't developed the ability to control their behaviors control their emotions um, control their feelings and I think sometimes that happens because kids come to rely so heavily on adults to do all of the controlling for them mm -hmm. to step in every time there's a problem to tell them every time they've stepped out of line a little bit or are doing the wrong thing, you know. Um, so there's not the opportunity for kids to self-correct mm -hmm. and to learn how to regulate themselves because there's always someone there to regulate for them. You know? I agree. Yeah. yeah. Do you see that, you know? Oh, or? yes. I mean, I, I, see, I see the lack of that, you know, self-regulation that we develop just playing with the neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in this school, we work on in that sense that we allow them first to solve the problems, you know, and see if they can figure out, and then of course we're there to guide them if they need help, but it's, right. we're all aware of that they are capable of solving many things and they have to learn, you know, how to figure things out. So right. that's super important for us. Right. Yeah, I know in general, in, in many um, places, I will say preschools, because unfortunately in the elementary school now the kids don't play anymore almost. So uh, in preschools, um, the tendency is to have the teachers on top of them, you know, on top of them all the time. Like if the teacher uh, were not doing his or her job just by watching and guiding them, and of course taking care of them and, and making sure they feel safe, 
but allow them that space because they need it. Right. You know, they need it to develop those social skills that you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. And also to develop a sense of confidence in their ability to handle yeah. these kind of problems yeah. when they come up. Of course. And right. Yeah, and the power they feel, you know, when they really find, you know, a way that works out. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have funny anecdotes about, like, CEOs <laughs> finding, you know, even things that you did yeah. don't occur to you when they were trying to hold her hand, you know, situations. Oh, which, I know. Yeah. Social skills, yes, like, they you know, they, they, they really know how to solve uh, yes. situations, right? Yeah, yeah, my older daughter for a while was saying, and, and then Lily, too. It, it, and then Lily, you're from her, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, my older daughter was, uh, you know, s feeling stressed out at home because there were several kids who wanted to hold her hand on the way to the playground. And more recently, she's talking about kids wanting to sit next to her in circle time. And, <laughs> Mommy, I don't know what to do. Everybody wants to sit next to me. I'm like, all right. <laughs> but, it, you know, it was far more stressful. And Aww. so, um, but she had come, she came up with, like, a whole system that she devised herself, and she felt really good about it. So she says, you know, she would say, Mommy, I... I Connor wanted to hold my hand today, but I, I told Connor that I'll, I'll, today's Leah's turn, I'll hold Connor's hand, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so she, so she felt really good. good, and then the same, yeah. a very similar situation ended up, I, I was hearing it from my younger daughter, Lily, and so Lexi was saying, Lily, this is what you need to do, <laughs> this is what you can try. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's so important, it, it, you know, it sounds like a small thing, but it's super important because they're so young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're already finding ways to solve you know, little situations that are very important for them. And then that's it. Then the problem will get solved and it won't be an issue anymore. Whereas if the adult jumps in and is like, okay, no, no, this is, you can't do this. This is what you need to do. Then the problem is going to keep coming up and right. every time an adult is going to get pulled into it. Right. So it's like. And then child then feels insecure and yeah. capable of being able to, you know, to cope with things. Right. Well, yeah. they develop a dependency on the adult, right. so it'll yeah. always be there. Right. right. Yeah. 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 What about other? Um, you guys see other benefits to unstructured play that we haven't talked about already? What else? What do we miss? What's important about unstructured play? I think having that uh, white space, you know, white time, blank time, mm -hmm. you know, chunk of time that were, you know, in general, I mean, for a routine of a child at home, is super important. When you said that they lose creativity, I think uh, I tried to make the connection, and it's probably because what you call to be the structure play time, you know, going to sports or activities, you know, and doesn't allow for the child just to do nothing, you know, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. I remember those moments in my childhood, how important they were, because I still feel the pleasure of finding stuff that, you know, I could do and never running out of ideas, you know, to do stuff. And it's because, uh, well, first I refused to go to preschool. I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> I did too. Yeah. So I told my mom because we didn't have a cottage school in La Plata. That's why. So, but I had five siblings there were. So I had those times at home by myself, even there were five. And I still remember, you know, how important uh, they were for me mm -hmm. to have uh, nothing to do and then finding what to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that, you know, unstructured, let's say, it's uh, missing sometimes now. Yeah. You know? I think one of the things mm -hmm. that adults, for some reason today, feel like they have to do is to always give children things to do. Things to do. Like, it's right. not okay if a kid is bored for a while. <laughs> but it's actually important for kids to be bored and to learn yeah. what to do with that, you yeah. know, to, to have the space to, right, to figure super, out. Super, super important because, yeah. for example, now I'm 50 and I, I don't mm -hmm. have the feeling of being bored, never. Mm -hmm. I, I always have something that, to do that, that I enjoy. Certain things I don't enjoy, like driving or stuff. But <laughs> I mean, it's not that you know I have that feeling that you know being bored. I mean, I don't. Uh, or people, you know, that feel that they, when they retire, what they're gonna do with their lives. And I'm like, you know, do you want some ideas? You know, <laughs> 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 like, yeah. you know, right? But yeah. I think it comes. It must come. I mean, you will know, but from childhood, right? Mm -hmm. Don't feel empty if you don't have something to be doing right now, right? Right. And also, and it goes back to what we were saying before, also not having the faith um, or the confidence that you even kind of know what you like to do. Mm -hmm. or then you score, that's right. Yeah, you know right. What you like to do. Right. Yeah. You know, getting back to the sports for a moment, you know, a lot of kids that are not athletically inclined today are still pushed to do a sport anyway because... Mm -hmm kids are not playing outside anymore. There's no neighborhood kids. You can just go knock on the door 
you know, and, and go play with anymore. So parents also feel like they have to en en enroll their kids in sports as a way to have social contact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But that oh, doesn't. Right. But sports are not for every mm -hmm. every kid. Mm -hmm. And so the kids kids end up feeling kind of forced into this uh, this activity that doesn't suit them. It doesn't uh, accentuate their strengths. It actually accentuates their weaknesses sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so they end up worse off, mm -hmm. you know, for being pushed into these kind of activities because they, they actually lose confidence, I think. Yeah. Some kids anyway, mm -hmm. you know. There's not as much room for the artistic kid mm -hmm. as there used to be, you know. Mm -hmm. Now the artistic kid is, is expected to play soccer and, you know, mm -hmm. Baseball and whatever else, you know. Mm. Um, let's talk about nature play for a while. All of us shared experiences of being in nature. Um, what would you guys say those experiences of being in nature kind of did for you? What, what were the benefits to you, um, to your development? And in what ways did those experiences in nature kind of influence you and affect you maybe now, even? Well, I think it's was mostly about being in an environment that was not comfortable, so to speak. It wasn't like your house, it wasn't a space that you knew, it was constantly changing. So every time you would go in the woods, it would be something different that you saw, and there would be something that you hadn't seen before. And you'd be digging and you'd maybe find something that you really had never experienced before, and it was a moment of true discovery. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, in your house, maybe you're from you. You know everything that's there, unless you go digging and you can recreate spaces though. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In your house. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All my mother's casseroles on the floor, you know, making like, well, an yeah. instrument, for example. Actually, I have a very <laughs> clear memory. My mom left one afternoon, and I took everything out of her drawers. Everything. And, I and then you reorganize it, it, right? I lined it up all around her room and I told her to come in when she got home to go shopping. Yeah. And I was expecting yeah. her to pay me real money for all of her things that were out. Because I said, it's my store. Your um, room becomes my store. Yeah. That's so funny. Leo does that with one of his cousins. <laughs> they take everything out of my mother's pantry, they make fake money, oh, they pass oh, it out okay. to everybody. Yeah. yeah, they love it. And yeah. she's going, Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drop any cans on your feet. Just leave them alone. They yeah. love that. But um, I guess it's also like nature almost becomes like a stage. So it's like you have, you can put on the most incredible shows and you can create your own, you have, you know, endless props and sceneries and things because it's, mm -hmm. it's a new space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of infinite. The possibilities yeah, are kind of infinite, exactly. right? Yeah. And you're alone too, right? There's no parents there. Mm -hmm. I feel like you, it's your own independent time. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what you've been saying too? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. the right way to say it. Yeah. Not yeah. that your parents are hovering over you in the house, but you you know, you're just outside. You're out you're right, outside yeah. of that realm. Just mm -hmm. No, I don't think my parents ever watched me. I mean, I'm sure they peeked their head out once in a while to see that I was okay. But I don't at least from my recollection, they never really were so aware of what I was doing at mm -hmm. all times. Mm -hmm. I know, you're right. Like, I would yeah. Yeah. I don't think if my mother even called us, she would have heard us at one in the, in the woods in the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she didn't think to do that. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. I would be kind of, I might not say anything, but I might be the widow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I didn't, of course, well. mother either. But I, I had the memories in nature for me are also the sense, you know, the senses, the feeling that I had there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the sense, of course, right? The memory of the I still, I still remember when I go to the beach and I smell the sea, it's mm -hmm. like, I mean, it's not that I feel young again, but almost, mm -hmm. it's like the memory goes right back into, you know, mm -hmm. those moments. So I think it's important that we express all the senses that are alive there in nature. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, you know, you mentioned the sense of ownership. You know, when you're out there on your in the woods on your own, the parents aren't there, it's yours, the experience is yours, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that sense of ownership is really kind of powerful yeah. for, for kids to experience, yeah. you know. It's really soothing. Soothing, yeah. I think one of the things that nature did for me, and now I see it in my kids, is just it's it like really taught me to notice things and appreciate mm -hmm. things, um, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful things, and like mm -hmm. the scents outside and all the beautiful images that you see in nature. And I'm not, a, I don't, my 
attention to detail isn't great. Like my husband just had to tell tell me recently what color our laundry room floor was because I didn't remember. But I feel like <laughs> outside, I just really I I see and appreciate every mm. every little thing, mm. um, and I see that in my kids too. Where uh, there was something I'm thinking of recently, we went to they do this um, Santa in town, um, and they light a Christmas tree and we're standing next to the pond um, in December and they have these luminaries around the pond and there was another girl in town who was saying, this is boring, this is silly, you know, kind of thing. And Lexi said, look at the beautiful oh. luminaries. I don't know what she called them luminaries, whatever she called them. Look at the beautiful lights. Oh, can you believe it? This is amazing. You know, that kind of thing. And um, I, think, I think just being in nature really gives you a sense of appreciation. But what you say about the other little guy, it's really sad because I yes. hear that, you know, in kids that were, um, I'm bored. You know, yes. This is boring. This is boring. You know, right. you know, and then I want to be like, right. shh. Like, <laughs> shh. Huh? I wanted to be like, shh. <laughs> because, like, Lexi's, like, so appreciative of everything that's going on and then next to her. And I don't think Lexi understood her. Like of it, course. You know, yeah. she's like, wait, what? Why? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> Lights and a pond and right. Santa. I mean, it's like so much, you know. But the ironic thing, I think, of what you just said and what Laura was touching on is those kids that are always like, I'm bored. I'm so bored. They're the ones that really haven't experienced yeah. Yeah. a solitary moment. Right. right. Mm. Those are the ones that haven't experienced actually having nothing stimulating. Nothing them. to mm-hmm. do. Yeah. Nothing to do. And that, um, that yeah. reminds me, I, I was thinking earlier when we were, I think, talking about nature or unstructured play and, um, you know, some of the benefits. I think one of the benefits of that and, and nature which is just um, learning how to sustain your attention on something. And mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. so the children who are used to going from one activity to the next are used to <clears throat> very structured activities you know, kind of everyone else is telling them what to do one thing after the next, they're never really given that opportunity to slow down and, and go deep, you know, within something. Mm-hmm. Um, so the second they're asked to sustain their attention for a little bit longer, it, it they can't, you know, right. they're, they need the next thing. That's right. one of the things that really got my attention when I, when I uh, started first grade in the private school and I'm there helping as a mother, right? And um, I'm coming from another country, you know, and things that then I see how young, you know, they were, only six years old, and they're rushing there, like 10 minutes of this, 15 minutes of that, mm-hmm. I'm like, right. I would have been, like, you know, mm-hmm. feeling really sad, or I don't know what, you know, when I, if I were exposed to that, so I had to then compensate at home, because it was like, a, you see these little kids just rushing from one thing to the other one, and of course there's no any empty time there or blank time in between activities Mm -hmm. because the transition times is when the kids just have more difficulties with the kids right so then if they didn't have that transition time then they can go from one thing to the other one and it's like crazy Mm -hmm. it's a race that is very stressful Mm -hmm. we talked about earlier we talked about kids learning to regulate their own behavior Mm -hmm. Um, attention issues are one of the biggest issues with kids today is Mm -hmm. kids have a lot of trouble regulating their attention and this is one of the reasons, because they're not getting outside, they're not in nature, they're not having these visceral sensory experiences that do help um, your nervous system to stay calm enough that you can attend. You know, they're instead spending all their time on these highly stimulating devices that are keeping their body, work. right, that's, but it's, and it's also keeping their bodies in such a, a hyperactive state that they can't possibly pay attention because their, their body won't settle long enough for them to sustain attention. So. Yeah, that's, that's a big They have big to issue. be paying extra, extra attention. I mean, it's like the, if, if you have directions, you know, 15 minutes later, you know, doing something and then something else and then something else, and I would have been lost. I mean, I was a very mm-hmm. distracted child, so I mm-hmm. know I would have been like looking at, at the ceiling thinking, okay, what did she say now? You know, 10 minutes after I'm mm-hmm. drawing this and then I have to jump mm-hmm. into, I mean, it's really crazy, it's mm-hmm. really crazy. Yeah, we're yeah. creating that in their environment and then we're mm-hmm. asking them at a young age to sit in a desk and focus for hours. Right. And after, right. as we're creating that? this environment that right. pretty much promotes the opposite. The opposite. And then we're diagnosing yeah. them with ADHD yeah, exactly. when they can't sit all day. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. right. It's a really unfair position that we put kids in. Yeah. You know? Something, Liza, you said um, also reminded me how important it is for kids to learn to be alone. Mm-hmm. Like, I, to me, you know, whenever yeah. I kind of give these kind of talks and I think about kind of what are some of the most central 
things that we as people, when we're children, need to learn, you know, um, in order to function, you know, eventually as adults. And one of the most central things I think is the ability to be alone, mm -hmm. the ability to be with ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that requires dealing with boredom. Mm -hmm. It requires maintaining a sense of connection to others, even when we're not physically with others. Um, it requires being able to soothe ourselves. You know, it requires kind of knowing ourselves well enough that we're not scared by what goes on inside of us. You know, these are all skills uh, kids need to learn, and um, a lot of kids are not learning it today because they, they're not having the opportunity to um, engage in these unstructured, uh, you know, activities in these unstructured environments that, that allow them to develop those kind of skills, you know, and to be able to practice being alone, basically, mm -hmm. you know. said before also soothing you find yeah. it soothing to be outside yeah. yeah I can't fall asleep sometimes I'll listen to like nature sounds like on my phone mm -hmm. or I'll open the window if it's like you know nice and yeah mm -hmm. yeah the next few days are going to be really long yeah. thinking all I'm going to do is just sit there without you to but he makes up yeah. his own games there you go right yeah. He's running around, he's throwing it around, he's talking, he's got his chicken coop on the side, he's got the whole room, he's throwing my house, he's like, he's like, right? I just leave everything, yeah. because yeah. Liam's by himself, he doesn't have a brother yeah. or sister. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, he does entertain himself. And there's a, there's a line there for me, because I mean, we play family games and we make sure we have time together, but I, I don't jump in. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he very rarely says he's bored, but sometimes he's just not sure what to do. I don't know if it's a transition period, like sometimes late afternoon before dinner or something like that. I don't know if he gets tired. Yeah, maybe yeah, he starts yeah. to sound Got bitter. From you know, school. right? Yeah. Or on, like on a Tuesday, that's a long day for him. Mm -hmm. He has movement twice, and then he comes up. <laughs> He's at the cottage school. From Tuesday, he has some it's a long day for him. in the morning, and then 2.30, yeah. But, but yeah, he's here, so I think it's different. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it's yeah. different. Yeah, he's I mean, still out of the house for a while, right? Mm -hmm. So he's really yeah. wiped out when he comes home. Sometimes he's not yeah. sure what to do with himself. So mm -hmm. I don't jump in and mm -hmm. fix it, but I'll help him. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like, well, what? You know, what do you feel like doing? Are you, you know, mm -hmm. do you feel like reading, or you know, this over here? I don't know if I should do that or not. But well, you know, I don't sit down and decide. Right, right, right. That's <laughs> my question. I think it's fine, right? Yeah. Helping yeah. your okay. child decide. Yeah. It's not Helping to spark their thought process. Yeah, about that's yeah. okay. Then. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also, especially if they come to you and that's seek it. guidance, mm -hmm. and it's not like it's not popular, like, tell me, I'm bored. Can you yeah. give me something to do? If it's yeah. genuinely like, yeah. what do you think yeah. I should do? I'm bored. Then it's mm -hmm. it's a, also it's a good moment for you to think about maybe what you do when you're bored. Mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, well, when I'm bored, I like to read. Do you want to read? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's all asking if they're asking. Also, if he's tired, I think creating something takes an energy too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. you have to right. be playing. You know, it takes a lot of energy. So, but if I he's tired, he may not have bored. the energy to create you know, something for him to do. To no, that's true. Yeah. Maybe relax, but he, he has said to me something about. He reads. I mean, like, well, he needs to figure it out. <laughs> I have said that, mm -hmm. and like, he would he pick up the book right yeah. away, right, and read for. Yeah, he reads a lot. I mean, he reads mm -hmm. a lot, so he has this time by himself. So. But I, I don't know how he feels. I feel that way sometimes. You know, I don't know at that transition period from coming to the office or going home, or mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a transition there, so I kind of mm -hmm. empathize him a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Some of the other uh, benefits of nature uh, play that I that I had down here were just the um, the basic fact of. Uh, reducing stress, just being outside mm -hmm. in nature, is just a relaxing, like you were saying, yeah. it's soothing. You know, it actually sure. does, it, it's been shown, being out in nature it has been shown to help with depression and anxiety and just uh, overall stress level. Um, what about, doesn't, I've heard this, aren't you supposed to put your feet on the ground every day to ground oh, yourself? Yeah, I've heard that also, <laughs> grounding, yeah. yeah. I don't know what it's called. It is grounding, yeah. I, I won't do it. I'm no, one they take down to it. To me, down to it. To me, down to <laughs> but somebody said that to me. You really mm -hmm. just get your bare feet on the earth every yeah. day. You really are supposed to kiss God. Yeah. I mean, it's it's true in electricity. You know, you release the 
universe and we are in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's yeah. physics. Right. So in addition to whatever you you are listening to, Laura. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And I'm just saying. I'll throw that on smart to do physics too. Yeah. yeah. No, that they had a physical contact with the earth, with, with the elements, you know, that physical contact with the elements, I think. Is, is and important. also the release of the energy, you know, right. how in, in Spanish it's cable tierra, she's not happy with the energy. No. Cable tierra. Yeah, the, the, no, like the, no, in the no. ground, the, um, ground, um, I mean, I look into them and come up with the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, to <laughs> stop somebody getting in shock, you know, Another benefit, I think, of uh, nature play is that it provides opportunities for kids to use the landscape in whatever way they see fit. So I talked about metaphors earlier. Um, often kids will project their experiences onto the toys, onto the toys they're using. When they're out of nature, they have the opportunity to project parts of themselves onto the landscape. Mm -hmm. So for one kid, um, the hill might be one particular thing, but for another kid, that, that hill would be something totally different. Um, Liam, my, my son, my two-year-old, um, a while you know a while back, wa found a. I was outside with him, and he came. Up, we came across this um, stump, this tree stump. You know, from an old cut down tree, and this, but the stump was actually hollowed out in the middle, like rotted out or something. So it was just kind of like a hollow, empty stump. And he decided to pretend it was a potty. So for him, <laughs> so for he didn't have to go in it, but he was pretending. So he, so for him, that that old rotted out tree stump was a potty. He happens to be at the age where we're, you know, beginning to kind of talk about potty training and using the potty and all that stuff. So for him, that was an expression of something he was going through, a phase in his life he was going through. Uh, but for another kid, that tree stump could have been something else. It could have been a cauldron. You know, they could have pretended to be a witch, and it would be a cauldron. So, mm -hmm. nature, per, you know, provides the opportunity for every kid to use it in whatever way kind of suits their needs in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know, there's also, a, I think, a, a spiritual aspect to being to being in nature, which I think is has been really important for me. You know, during my adult life. Um, some of my most spiritual, and I'm not a religious person, but um, I consider myself a spiritual person, and some of my most spiritual experiences, most of them have been in nature, you know, either observing something in nature um, in kind of a meditative way, you know, like you were saying. Um, and so I think it's really beneficial for kids to grow up with a sense of spirituality, too, to being connected to the, to the universe, connected to the world. Um, Something else nature provides also, we were talking about transitions and how difficult transition periods can be for everyone, really, not just kids, but adults, too. Um, being exposed to nature really provides you with a sense of natural transitions, you know, the, the transition from, um, from day to night, from night to day, from season to season, you know, all these natural transitions. I think kind of really gives us um, the ability to to make transitions in our daily lives. You know, we, we, see the, we see the squirrels experiencing the transitions out of nature. Well, we're a part of nature too. If we, if, if we feel connected to that nature, that gives us a sense that we can also transition gracefully the way that nature does. Um, that's kind of a, maybe a spiritual take on it also or a philosophical take on it. But I think, you know, those kind of experiences are important for kids. Um, what about you guys? Do you resonate with that, with that idea? I, there's actually a, Adolescence in Sonoma, so the adolescent, you know, the adolescents that come from adolescence, right? mm -hmm. so uh, there's a whole experience on uh, people from a tribe, you know, and uh, I think it's the adolescence in Sonoma. I can look for it in English. I mean, really a long time ago, but it was uh, very interesting to see how they, because they had so much contact with nature. There were no really uh, big issues in the adolescence period part. It was mm -hmm. like a very, very smooth transition. Mm -hmm. so the whole style was about that, you know, mm -hmm. how being connected to the nature and to the different roles in the tribe, you know, made the whole adolescence um, to be uh, smooth, you know, which Interesting. is incredible because yeah. the war itself comes, you know, from having problems, you know, adolescence is to have problems, right? Interesting, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, because so like nature still doesn't have any meaning, right? Mm -hmm. Nature's right. Meaning is just our word, you know. So. Mm -hmm. 
right. adolescente in Spanish comes from adolescer, which adolescer is to go through travels. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Actually. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have to find out that style is very, very interesting. Right, yeah. right. So, so nature yeah. helps teenagers oh. with their troubles, adolescents yeah. with their, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. what, how are we doing on time? What, uh, what time do we have? I don't know what time it is. Five eight. Okay, so we'll, I guess, begin to wrap up, actually. Um, as happened last time with the talk on emotional development, um, there was stuff that I didn't get to, and so mm -hmm. perhaps on Monday it'll be kind of a part two, like the like the last talk oh, was. Oh, okay, yes. You know, so for me, because I'm going to do Monday. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the rest can go on Monday. Um, so oh, I, it's, oh, I didn't know. I signed up. I didn't know what workshop it was. I just signed up. Oh, for everything. Cool. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> I that's See, awesome. See, this is part of play for me, right? There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you extend though into this what you mentioned? If you had read it, um, that you said, okay, they had a different language. You know, they really speak in metaphors. So, so can you give an example copy of that to to? Sure, sure. Um, how about, is it okay if I get into that a little on Monday? Or do you want me to give an example now? You want, you want an example now? You have something simple. Let me see if I can pull something up. Yeah. Um, like the party so, and the nature now. Well, that. this might not be so much metaphorical, but it is symbolic. I'll give an example of, of a way that kids often use um, symbols in their play. Mm -hmm. Like when they come to my office, for instance, and I, and I do you know, play therapy with them. Um, so rather than, rather than a child directly talking about the fact that, you know, I just recently had a baby sister and I've gotten used to, you know, for the last four or five years, I've gotten used to having my parents all to myself mm -hmm. and this is really upsetting me. I'm really angry about, you know, uh, this, this new child, this new person who is in our house. You know, a five or six year old, seven year old, they're not gonna come to my office and say that necessarily, but what they can do is they can use the sand tray that I have in the office and they can use objects in the room. They can take animal you know, figures um, and they can create a scene in the sand tray um, that has to do with uh, maybe aggression between the animals or a conflict that arises between the animals. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a way that they can kind of project their story yeah. okay. onto the figures and mm -hmm. symbolically um, express and communicate what it is that they're going through. So mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than them having to say, either because they don't have the words for it or the sophistication to say this, rather than them say, um, I'm really angry and sometimes I really hate this new baby who's around. Mm -hmm. They can enact that. Mm -hmm. And it's through that process of enacting it, through that process of symbolizing it, that some of those feelings can be released a little bit. Especially if they're with an adult who's giving them the space to express it without too much interjecting, mm -hmm. um, without structuring it too much, allowing them the freedom to kind of express it in, in their own way. Um, that's a way they can symbolize their experience. Okay. Uh, does that help to answer the question? No, it helps. I was just thinking about a, a metaphoric way, and I couldn't find, you know, but if you talk about sim, you know, projecting or enacting, you know, and yes, I mean, we see it. Yeah. Right, right. It's actually a great tool for you to have. Yeah. You know, toys there or you know, puppets or stuff that they can use to play with. Right. Stories okay. are often, um, you know, um, fairy tales. Have that aspect of, of metaphor. Oh, you know, oh uh, no. that's yeah. What, yeah, right. That's They're based what, on mm -hmm. symbolism. Yeah, exactly. Symbolism. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and they're based, um, I think, on real, actual experiences that people have. You mm -hmm. know, um, all those difficult, all those feelings kids grow up with that are not so easy for them to to communicate and to you know to express and to cope with. Um, fairy tales do a really good job of putting those kind of. Uh, inner conflicts, those scary feelings into metaphors and telling a story, you know, that kind of uh, metabolizes the feelings, you know. Yeah, okay, now I wanted to see where you um, were trying to refer that to, because yeah. one thing that, yeah, we have to say, we do stories here all the time, mm -hmm. but one thing that I um, explain to the teachers is that they don't really explain the story, so we tell the story, mm -hmm. the puppets are there, and the story is done. Right, you know? right because we don't know what they can interpret you know, from a story. And right. um, for us, it's really important that the child would process that internally and that we're not giving them the answers, you know, the whole explanation, but who knows, right. who knows what each child is really processing inside. So yeah. it's symbolic, you know, story, uh, folk tales actually have a happy ending and that's important because then the kids have the hope to, 
there's always the bad and the good in the story, and there has to be the bad part and the good part, and then there's a happy ending. That's how a folk tale is defined, actually. If it doesn't have a happy ending, it's not a folk tale. Mm. So with the, all that symbolism, then the child can process, you know, they go through all these conflicts, you know, and parents think, okay, I'm gonna remove the witch from the story. No, leave right, it there. Right, it's super right. important, because they have to see, you know, the really bad part is usually ugly and the worst, you know, you can, and then the good part is usually really good, right? right? So if they can see that black and white, it's easier for the kids, and and then the happy end then helps them realize that there's hope. Mm -hmm. right. That they can really find a solution to a problem, right? So all that symbolism, I thought you were referring to, um, to some language or you know something else that they uh, would use as a metaphor, but mm -hmm. it's mostly through the play, right? Right. Through the, the language right. of the play itself. The language of the play, exactly. Yeah. That's a perfect way the to put it. The language of yeah. the play. The language yeah. of the play, yeah. And what you said about not providing too much explanation about the story afterwards, yeah. I think that's that's really valuable Super because. Important. The meaning that a story has for one child might be different than different. the meaning another child has. Yeah. And if you impose a meaning on it, then you take something away from that you child. You take something away. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, especially with folk tales, because folk tales come from many, many years. They've been around for so many years that they've been like, uh, purified already and going through so many people in different generations, different cultures, and everything. And so they are, uh, they have all the mythology in them and the symbolism in them, very pure. Right. So if you change, you know, you say, okay, I'm gonna remove this because I, you are making your own version of the story, let's say, but it's not the folk tale, it's not a folk tale anymore if right. you're taking part of it, right? It's like everything is connected there. Right. Um, it's super important not to explain the stories. Yeah. yeah. I've had similar experiences in the classroom, mm -hmm. but with poetry. Um, the same thing, because yeah. it's an art form. So exactly. how can you explain a poem? You know, a poem exactly. is there. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can see when you when we retell it each week. You can even see like because we go through the book and we'll repeat um, you know the poems and the rhymes and the songs that we've done each week. Mm -hmm. And when we get to certain ones, you know, certain kids are more tuned into certain poems or songs or rhymes that they remember that maybe resonated with them. At that moment, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and like, earlier in the year, I remember I chose this one poem from a um, from a poet from Myanmar, and um, one of the students had a very emotional reaction to the mm -hmm. poem, and picked out a line and even said, "You know, I I, I feel that," wow. and that was a very rewarding moment, a, right? a moment. precious yeah. moment. Yeah. yeah. And if you, I think if you do that with a story or with a poem, yeah. you're gonna, first of all, you're like dissecting, you know, and taking all the art apart from the yeah. piece uh, and making your own judgments when you really not, are not allowing the child to make. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to what we said about playing and being on top of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids playing and parents or teachers on top of them all the time. Yeah. It's very similar mm -hmm. uh, to what happened if we are always there, right? Yeah. Explaining or. Yeah giving our own impression of things, yeah. you know, um, or wanting the kids to learn that, you know, thinking that it's important for them to learn the main character of the story. And all that spirituality or the process that goes inside is, is more important than that, whatever they can intellectualize about it. And I, I think, actually, I have this discussion with my husband a lot when it comes to going to art museums, and that he wants me to explain every piece of art that we mm. come in contact with. And one day we were, um, I think we were in MoMA, and I was just like, just feel it. Mm -hmm. I said, it doesn't matter what the history is. Some are all yeah. white right anyway. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, well, you... What do you want me to explain? <laughs> well, he's like, well, you studied art history. What does this painting mean? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't know. Because what I, when I see it and what I get from looking at it and when I experience it is going to be completely different. Yeah. Than what, how you react to it and how you feel, and he said, "Well, I don't think I like it." And I'm like, "It's funny okay, too. Some people to like yeah. have to verbally mediate, you know, yes. visual information, mm -hmm. right. and that is how they understand things. So mm -hmm. some people can't look at a piece of art or a picture and, you know, how just impression. They're low, yeah, they're not as connected to that feeling, and they they need somebody. They need to kind of overlay, you know, a verbal description mm -hmm. on it." 
I see that a lot at work because I, you know, assess cognitive abilities. And so some yeah. people are, you know, looking at a visual spatial task mm -hmm. that looks very abstract to me, but they're, um, you know, verbalizing this detail and that's helping them yeah, to right. figure out the task or remember it later. Um, or some people will need the picture. Like, you know, okay, can you draw it? Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. I will understand, you know, some are more visual learners. Yeah, yeah, so those verbal But I think also there is the habit in. of trying to analyze and yeah. overanalyze yeah. stuff, you know, when, when you know, it's not necessary. Unless you are doing a study or research on, you know, in a piece, you know. Exactly. But, yeah. but that's that's a different skill set. It's too. different. Mm -hmm. Or you're studying art history. Okay, it's a different story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I see that too with, like, the kids, you know, doing artwork at home, painting or drawing or something, somebody will come into the house and look at one of their drawings and say, that looks like blah, blah, blah. I'm like, shit, like, don't say that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe Who knows that. One thing. Yeah, maybe it was something totally different. And then they're thinking, oh, I guess it doesn't look like, you know, I know. They, that they failed at doing, making it look like what they wanted it to look like because somebody else came in and said it looks like this. Yeah. You know? It's, yeah, it's, it's... So... What I'd like to um, focus on on Monday for those of you who might come or watch online or, you know, um, that's things we didn't get to. I would like to spend some time on Monday talking about the value of um, the relationship between a child and an adult during play activities um, and the value of uh, that facet of play is the relationship aspect of it. Um, so I'm going to spend you know, more time on Monday focusing on that. Um, and we'll touch on some other things too that we didn't cover tonight. Um, but before we stop, I'm wondering, did anybody kind of actually make something with their with their play? -Doh? I just kind of fiddled yeah. with it the whole time. It probably <laughs> helps me with my nerves uh, while we were doing this. But circle, but I. <laughs> <laughs> you made a beautiful. I know. Job. I, I made a taco. taco. You made a cake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So that, half moon taco. That's a pretty impressive flower. That's that very impressive. Really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So a flower, a taco. Taco. Oh, taco. I have a, a little taco. snail. Oh, oh, snail. Okay. Um, and a little cube oh, tower. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> collection. You can have a whole story there. I know. I mean, I know. We're just doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're just doing the same thing. Yeah. 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 I'm just putting my jaw back. Yeah. Yeah. But play. actually, you, I, mean, I watch you making that. I'm like, okay, you should play with the dice you know, that you're making there. Yeah. Because it's like, <laughs> yeah. We do I many like games with just one dice, actually. Yeah. Great. Did you make? Oh, I made a lot of things. I made a bowl. <laughs> okay. I saw your bowl. Yeah. <laughs> Would anyone like to comment on what they made? Uh, was there any particular reason behind what you chose to make, or uh, anything? Like why um, the flower, for instance? No, I didn't intellectualize it. But now, okay, I, yeah. now that I see, I remember. Uh, now that we're talking about childhood, let's see. Um, I'm getting old, and you know, you remember <laughs> more and more from your childhood. As you, it's I, I used to make uh, flowers with my siblings or cousins or they too. Mm. With, um, you know what part, the inside of the baguette, you know, of the bread? Okay. Oh, the yeah. white part, the oh. miga. Yeah, like we, dough meat, like where it's really with dough the, meat. The, yeah, do you call the it? The miga. I, my mom always calls it the flesh, but I'm not sure. Oh. The oh. flesh, you know, or whatever, the miga. It's yeah. Spanish miga. So with yeah. that part, <laughs> actually, <laughs> you could make oh, stuff. And so yeah. you should press right. the roller. Do you? Do you do that? Yeah. 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 Um, well, because my mom so. only likes the crust, and I only like the inside. <laughs> yeah. So she would always hand me uh, pieces and pieces of the inside, and she would make them into things, and then I would eat them. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you can use them as erasers, too. Oh, I didn't know. Did no. Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can. It works as a razor. I always wear the very shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what to do also if you don't find glue in the house. Remember, we're five in my house. So we were looking for. You just mix flour and water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's I what you do. You just have a brush and a brush. And actually, it's very good. You can make it. Um, so I don't know if there's another reason why I made it with flour. No, I wasn't looking for anything necessarily deep, you know. But I, was just, I was curious. You know, I was just curious. What this, about other people? This is just soothing. It's yeah. just like, yeah. it gave me something to fidget with the whole time. And then, I don't know, the indentations, like, yeah. kids are the size of my fingers, obviously, because I'm making it. I don't know, they're comforting to my fingers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's good. I was at one of the doctors said that Yeah. In certain situations, uh, some sort of yeah, some of us just 
like to or to keep our bodies moving and this yeah. is a way to keep our body moving kind of. You I know? always have something in my hand now that I'm thinking mm. about. Mm. I always have a pen in my hand, something in my hand, even when I'm driving. <laughs> I don't know. I have something in my hand. Mm. Right. Like if I wasn't doing this, right. I might be like shaking like this, you mm. know, the right. shaking my leg, you know. Yeah. Right. Like, right. Listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually wonderful for the kids to have play with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Super, yeah. Mm -hmm. How about the butterfly? Any mm -hmm. particular? Oh, my snail. Oh, the snail. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Why did I say it. butterfly? No, it's um. I just I made a braid, and then I was looking at it, and I thought that it looked better as a snail because I had two <laughs> little ends coming up. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he kind of made. What did you make? Did you make? I just use it as kind of a fidget toy, you know, like mm -hmm. you were saying, just something to kind of fidget with. I think it probably yeah. helps me with my nerves a little bit during this, you know, talk, yeah. you know, I'm on camera and all that stuff. So, um, I think I also just that's like, about the camera. just like the feel of it, you know, so that's how I used it. The, the reason I was asking, you know, what everybody did with it is because everybody did something a little bit different. Some of us yeah. use it purely for um, just tactile, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, we like the tactile aspect of it um, and maybe the stress relieving aspect of it also. Um, others of us created something that reminded us of something we used to do, you know, as a child, you know. Um, yeah. And maybe we didn't realize it, you didn't realize it at the time you were making it, but then after reflecting on it, it brought you well, back you to a memory. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's kind of, uh, that's kind of one of the, the values of play for kids, is that they don't necessarily have to be aware, consciously aware, of why they're doing what they're doing. You know, they don't have to be consciously aware of what the different elements in their stories or their play routines symbolize. Um, they can create these things and it can be kind of a release. Um, it can be kind of a, um, a grounding, kind of a centering kind of experience. Um, and if you have faith in the process of play, you come to realize that whatever children are creating does have some meaning for them. Even if they're not able to articulate it. You know, you creating that flower had some meaning for you. I guess yeah. so now that you ask it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so I guess I just wanted to leave us with that point that play is always mm -hmm. meaningful, especially when it's that unstructured kind of play that allows for creativity. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Thank Jason. You.